Hi everyone, I am Heather Wade and I'm a second year PhD student at Lancaster University being supervised by Dr. David Sabral. Today I will be talking to you about how we search for the brightest distant Lyman alpha emitters in the cosmos field, probing into the epoch of reionization using near-infrared narrowband data taken with the VLT and the Hawkeye instrument. Briefly, this project aims to discover very bright distant galaxies of redshift 7.7 well into the epoch of reionization, when the universe was just 700 million years old. These bright early galaxies are thought to be the progenitors of present day massive galaxies and are thought to have played some role in reionization, but there are still many major open questions. The epoch of reionization marks the last major phase transition of hydrogen and is a mysterious and fascinating realm in the very early universe. It likely started with the formation of the very first stars at redshifts of 15 or more, and it lasted until approximately redshift 6, but the exact limits are still unknown. One of the current accepted models of reionization is called patchy reionization, and it's visualized in this video. This model suggests that reionization was an inhomogeneous process, which started with the very first stars and galaxies. These sources at the highest redshifts are thought to have ionized the neutral hydrogen clouds surrounding them, forming bubbles of ionized hydrogen around the galaxies that kept growing and overlapping until the entire universe was formed of ionized hydrogen. There are still plenty of open questions about reionization, such as how did the process develop, what are the sources of reionization, and what can be learned about these sources. For example, the exact relative contributions to cosmic reionization of massive stars and AGM are still unknown, as are the contributions from the many faint galaxies and the rarer but brighter galaxies. Patchy reionization suggests that the brighter sources have a dominating role in reionization, so studying these further will be important for testing this model and for understanding the epoch of reionization. In order to observe these galaxies, however, they need to be inside ionized bubbles that are large enough for the galaxy's Lyman alpha emission to be redshifted out of them, as this diagram shows. This can be used to calculate the size of such reionization bubbles. For example, the galaxy Kola 1, thought to be a redshift 6.59, has been calculated to require a bubble with radius um, 300 kiloparsecs to be observed. The results of this project will shed light on the size of bubbles that were possible at redshift 7.7, by finding new galaxies here, following in the footsteps of Ursh et al. 2015, for example, where they spectroscopically confirmed a galaxy at redshift 7.73. A very successful method to search for high redshift galaxies is using the Lyman alpha emission line. This emission line is especially useful because above redshift 2, it is shifted into the optical wavelengths and because it is intrinsically the strongest emission line. It has a UV rest frame wavelength of 1216 angstrom, and it implies the presence of O and B stars, which ionize the neutral hydrogen surrounding them. In order to use the Lyman alpha emission line to find high redshift galaxies, narrowband surveys are carried out. If your narrowband filter covers your redshifted Lyman alpha wavelength, you will see a transmission excess in the narrowband compared to a broadband filter at a similar wavelength and you will see your narrowband filter light up um, like this diagram shows. A certain amount of progress has already been made in this field with narrowband surveys um, discovering Lyman alpha emitters through various redshifts, meaning that we can track their evolution. Comparing data for different redshifts, we can look at Lyman alpha luminosity function, which plot number density against luminosity. Here we are seeing that the Lyman alpha luminosity function below redshift seven in blue is well established with plenty of confirmed Lyman alpha emitters um, at both the bright end and the faint end. Um, however, as we delve above redshift seven, further into the epoch of reionization, um, the Lyman alpha luminosity function is less established with far fewer confirmed sources and the bright end is extremely empty. This work aims to find bright Lyman alpha emitters in redshift 7.7 .7 to populate the bright end of the Lyman alpha luminosity function, or at the very least, place good constraints on it and use these to plan future wide, deep narrowband surveys. 
The luminosity function explains the statistical overview of laminar emitters and illustrates the general population, but we can also study the individual galaxies in much greater detail. Spectroscopic follow-up has helped uncover the inter internal structures and properties of these distant galaxies. Let's take the galaxy CR7. This was discovered by a group led by David Sabrell, and it is currently the brightest known galaxy in the early universe. CR7 is at redshift 6.6, .6, meaning we are looking back to when the universe is only 800 million years old. Since its discovery, CR7 has been observed spectroscopically by many telescopes. This plot shows results from observations from Subaru, Hubble Space Telescope, ALMA, and the Very Large Telescope. By combining all of this data, it has been found that CR7 is made of at least three clumps labeled A, B, and C, from brightest to dimmest. An approximate dynamical masses of each of these clumps can be estimated. The blue contours map the size of the Lyman alpha halo, which is a feature caused by the Lyman alpha photons scattering beyond the region where they are produced. By observing CR7 with Subaru, we can see that the Lyman alpha halo extends beyond um, over, all, over all three of the clumps, um, and the halo is brightest with the brightest clump. When observing the C2 line with ALMA, CR7's 3D structure is seen, shown by the red, green, and light blue contours. My work will hopefully reveal the structures of yet more ancient galaxies, and more spectroscopic follow-up on a large sample will help us to paint the bigger picture of the early universe. Although the main science goal of this project is to find Lyman alpha emitters at redshift 7.7, .7, many other lower redshift galaxies will be discovered along the way, mostly H alpha, O2, and O3 emitters. Studying these lower redshift galaxies is still very useful in order to better understand galaxy evolution over the past 13.9 billion years. The data that I'll be using to do all of this uh, was collected during a 44-hour observing run of the cosmos field using Hawkeye on the Very Large Telescope in Chile. The filter MB1060 was used, making this a near-infrared narrowband survey. There are a total of 69 pointings in the cosmos field, some deep and some shallow, covering around one degree squared, with the survey designed to overlap with the deepest ultravista stripes. We decided to reduce the data ourselves with a dedicated pipeline to get the best possible quality of data. To extend our search for redshift 7.7 .7 Lyman alpha emitters, we include archive data for, um, for the Good South Field, also collected with Hawkeye. The single pointing is significantly deeper than the Cosmos data, with around 31 hours of exposure time in just this one pointing. Unfortunately, not all the data has been uh, fully reduced yet. It's a very long process, but some progress has been made in identifying line emitters. So for the good south field shown here, all the necessary aperture and color corrections have been applied and line emitters have been selected using these criteria in equivalent width and excess significance. This color magnitude diagram shows these cuts and the emitters are shown in light blue and the limiting cases are in dark blue. This gives us 503 line emitters for the good south field, and the data reaches a three sigma limiting magnitude of 25.6. This has also been done for almost all of the deep cosmos pointings with a mean depth of 23.6, and 1,073 line emitters have been selected. With the majority of the shallow cosmos pointings complete, we can find around 725 line emitters and a depth of 23 magnitudes. For all 69 pointings, we will have a very large sample of hundreds of line emitters, and hopefully some of them will include previously undiscovered high redshift galaxies. We then match our detected sources with catalogues for photometric and spectroscopic redshifts to further investigate the sample. Looking at the photometric redshift distribution of line emitters in the Good South and Cosmos Deep samples, we can see clear peaks for a lot of emission lines, especially H alpha N2, O3 H beta, and O2. Our initial number estimates from, um, from photometric and spectroscopic redshifts are shown on the right. 
um, these are already really good numbers and there's even more data yet to come. From the initial photometric ratio values, we can further investigate the sample as there are lots of line emitters that don't have established photometric or spectroscopic ratio values. Um, and ideally we want to work out which line they're emitting and those are shown um, as the black points. So color color diagrams help us with this. And here we have our Cosmos Deep sample in two different color color spaces. The first plot sp splits the sample into greater than and less than redshift 0 0.8, which isolates our redshift 0 0.6 um, H alpha emitters in green. Next, we can take everything in this redshift greater than 0 0.8 region and look at these sources in the BZK color space. This diagram splits sources up um, by redshift greater than 1.5 or less than 1.5 and therefore isolates our redshift 1.103 emitters from our redshift 1.802 emitters. Again, here we are seeing plenty of these black points without photometric redshift values, which we need to define as an emission line. But this was supposed to be a talk about Lyman alpha emitters in the epoch of ionization. So back to them. Here in this color color diagram, we see the approximate area where we'd expect to see redshift 7.7 .7 Lyman alpha emitters. And we can already see that there are some points here um, and some without any um, redshift values. Once we add in the rest of the data, good south and the shallower cosmos pointings, we will, this area will hopefully be more populated and we'll hopefully, um, we'll find a small sample of redshift 7.7 .7 Lyman alpha emitters. Just one final plot takes us back to the H alpha sample that we have found so far, which we can already plot as a preliminary um, luminosity function. Despite further work yet to be done, our sample in green is comparable to the other samples, similar redshifts, which is very good news. Continuing this work, we can better understand the trends and evolution of lower redshift line emitters by hopefully, and by hopefully finding a redshift 7.7 .7 Lyman alpha emitter sample we can learn more about the epoch of ionization and the size of the ionized bubbles these sources produce. Hopefully your paper with all of this will be out soon in the next few months, hopefully. Now on to future work. The James Webb Space Telescope will be massively helpful in unraveling the structures of these ancient galaxies. This image from the JWST website even contains CR7 as it will be one of the first targets for observation. One of the four main scientific aims of G JWST even specifically discusses studying the epoch of ionization. As well as JWST, the upcoming Moon's instrument, multi-object optical and near-infrared spectrograph on the VLT, can be used for follow-up spectroscopy on the H-alpha, O3 and O2 emitters as well. So to quickly summarize, my project aims to find a few Lyman alpha emitting galaxies, a redshift 7.7, in order to better understand the early universe and the epoch of ionization. This will be done with both a st statistical approach using luminosity functions and a more detailed approach using spectroscopic follow-up on individual galaxies that I find. Thank you for listening and if you have any questions feel free to leave a comment below. Thank you.